Friends, welcome to this hour of worship with First Baptist Church of Ann Arbor. I'm Paul. I'm Stacy. We are privileged to be the co-pastors of this great congregation and to welcome you, whoever, wherever you are, uh, joining us in this hour of worship. You will find in the video description a link to indicate that you're with us. We love to know who is joining with us. You'll also find a link indicating your desire to receive our weekly church news communication if you're not already doing so. Today and the following two Sundays, we are having three very special occasions. Today, uh, we are calling Walk Up. Next Sunday is Walk With. And the Sunday following is the best of all, walk in. Uh, today, walk up refers to uh, an ice cream fellowship time together. Uh, it happens on the church parking lot. We can accept a very few cars parked in the lot. Otherwise, you'll take free parking across the street. And there's also uh, handicap parking uh, along the curb uh, near to beside our church. Bring a friend if you'd like. This will be a time to have a tasty treat and also to see one another and greet each other again. The following Sunday walk with is our crop walk. We do this annually in October with other congregation and congregations and interested people. We'll gather again at the uh, parking lot. Not all of us will be walking, but all of us can gather. There will be a prayer of blessing together, and then some of us will be taking the walk. And then on Walk In Sunday, October 10, we will be worshiping together, those who are able and willing, in the sanctuary of First Baptist Church. That's on October 10, 10, 10, at 10 o'clock in the morning. These are exciting events to look forward to, especially two Sundays from today. Again, we're so glad that you have joined us today for worship. We invite each of us, all of us, to join our hearts in worship now. A reading from the Psalms. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side when our enemies attacked us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away, the torrent would have gone over us, then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. The word of the Lord. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
morning, kiddos. Today for Time as Children, I would like to share with you a book called What is God Like? This is by Rachel Held Evans and Matthew Paul Turner. The illustrations are by Ying Tan. What is God like? That's a very big question. One that people from places all around the world have wondered about since the beginning of time. And while no one has seen God, because God is far too big for us to fully see, we can know what God is like. It's good to ask questions like this. What is God like? God is like an eagle, sharp-eyed and swift, with wings so wide you can play under their shadows. God is like a river, constant and life-giving. When you grow near God, you'll sprout up strong as a tree. God is like the stars, forever present and bright. Even when they feel far away, you can always look up and see them winking at you. God is like a shepherd, brave and good, a protector who loves her sheep so much that she watches over all of them and knows each of their names by heart. Can you hear these ideas of what God is like come from the Bible? God is like a fort, strong and secure with walls that are mighty and safe. Inside, there are hidden places to hold you when you're scared or need a quiet place to rest. God is like a gardener, patient and nurturing. God plants waters, weeds, and fertilizes the earth until every good thing on it seeks the nourishing sun and grows. God is like the flame of a candle, warm and inviting. With God close by, you can look to the light and see through the darkest of nights. God is like the wind, passionate and full of mystery. God is both here and mysteriously also over there. God is everywhere, swirling throughout the world, whistling across mountain ranges, rustling through trees and pressing against your cheeks on a breezy day. God is like an artist, creative and unpredictable, always busy making and remaking everything brilliant and new. God is like a mother, strong and safe, you can crawl up into her lap wherever you want to, whenever you want to, and she will hold you until you fall asleep. God is like a father, gentle and safe. He will put you on top of his shoulders to give you a bird's eye view of all of creation. God is like three dancers graceful and precise. They move to the same music in, every, in very different ways, showcasing all of God's elegance and rhythm in your life. God is like three dancers. God is like a rainbow, vivid and full of color, a dazzling reminder of promise and a hope for all people after a storm. God is like a best friend, faithful and true, closer to you than even your brothers and sisters. And because we know what God is like, we know that God is kind. God is forgiving. God is slow to get angry, God is quick to be glad. God is happy when you tell the truth and sad when things are unfair.
She is your protector. He is trustworthy. They are friends when you feel alone. God hopes. God perseveres. What is God like? That's a very big question. One that people from, pl from places all around the world throughout all time have answered in many different ways. Keep searching. Keep wondering. Keep learning about God. But whenever you aren't sure what God is like, think about what makes you feel safe. What makes you feel brave? And what makes you feel loved? That's what God is like. So kiddos, I invite you to keep wondering, to keep asking questions. What is God like? And we know that we will experience God as we wonder about God. Amen. A reading from the letter of James. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. And anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. God of every tender mercy, God who is present in all of our circumstances and all of our consequences, we come to you, as always, with the whole complicated truth of who we honestly are. Grant us to know more deeply that your love comprehends the tangled mix of feelings and regrets and anxieties and aspirations and uneasiness and gratitude that exist within us. We thank you for your acceptance of who we really are. Continue, we pray, to make use of our imperfections and failures. Lead us through our uncertainties and confusions. Consecrate the gifts that you have placed within us and use them according to your will. Free us from our sins. Strengthen our relationships. Help us to know a truer joy. Clarify our vision. Increase our faith. Lead us more and more in your ways. We pray now for people across the world who are ill or dying of COVID and for their loved ones and for those who work to care for them. We pray that more and more people will receive vaccines. We pray for our own deeply and continually divided nation. And we pray for people everywhere who are oppressed persecuted, abused, abandoned. May those who seek to be help for them be strengthened and protected. May people like us grow freer of obsession with ourselves so as to be more mindful of the many who suffer terribly and to be of greater service to the needs of your larger world. 
We pray now in particular for these, for Vicki Williams, Stacy Duke, Phil White, Joe and Kathy Mortensen, Ron Tipton, Mary Margaret Hatt, Astrid Back, Esther Floyd, Rob Rushton, Maria Pirantosi, Marilyn Marsh, Betty Gersler, Iris Martin, Tori McGowan, Anne Garvin, Katie Mason, Tom and Kim Voitall, Tom and Terry Rubenstein, Barry Smith, John Rowe, Ken Riggs, Lydia, Faye Key, Janet Myers, Sam Storch, Nick Hewitt, and Eric Milbourne. Now open our eyes to the new possibilities that your Spirit sets before us. Lead us today with all our hearts to say yes to your love and yes to your world, to your creation, and to all people whom you call us to love and to serve. We pray all these things through Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As many of you know, I've been having a difficult time lately as I have faced new medical challenges as part of some ongoing long-term health issues. It has been a painful and frustrating and frightening time, and not just for me, but for those who love me. One thing that the sufferer and the people who care for the one who suffers have in common is this, a loss of control. I haven't been able to change or fix my own suffering and neither has anyone who cares about me. 
So we instead look for things we can control, things we can do to try to make things better in some way. People who care try to do practical things that will make a difference, things that will make life more comfortable even in the midst of suffering that can't be fixed. And it really does help. It doesn't fix the suffering, but it helps. But there's also something else, something that feels less practical, something that can feel sort of second rate, something we do when we feel like we've run out of other options for helping. I'm talking about prayer. We say to someone who is hurting, I'm praying for you. And what do we mean by that? What are we doing exactly? Doesn't God know what we need? If God is good, isn't God already working for our good? And if we ask God for something specific for ourselves or for someone else, are we treating God as some kind of genie there to just grant our wishes? What are we doing when we pray? Are we trying to convince God of something? Trying to change God's mind? Trying to control God? Are we trying to get God to care about something God doesn't already care about? When we bump up against these questions and the big mystery of prayer, it's, it's easy to just fall back on the idea that Prayer is not about changing God, but about changing the person who prays. The prayer is not about changing circumstances or suffering. It's about changing the person who prays. And it's true. Prayer does change us. When we focus our thoughts and our hearts on God and on communicating with God, that can't help but shape who we are and who we are becoming. Even current scientific research bears that out, shows that prayer improves self-control, makes you nicer, makes you more forgiving, increases a sense of trust, and offsets the negative health effects of stress. It's reassuring to know that prayer does, in fact, change those of us who pray and for the better. But that is not the whole story of what prayer is and what prayer does. Biblical understandings of prayer are much bigger than that and much stronger than that and certainly more radical than that. Prayer is more than a tool for spiritual growth and development. The biblical witness testifies that prayer does change us, but it also changes the world. For James, our pragmatic, action-oriented biblical writer, prayer is a form of action. Prayer is the first and most practical response to any given situation. For people of faith, prayer is not a last resort, but a first response. Are any among you suffering? He writes, they should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. You could almost hear the list go on from there. Are any of you angry? Pray. Are any of you lonely? Pray. Are any of you in despair over violence or poverty or white supremacy or climate change or the pandemic? Pray. Pray. 
Are any of you out of work? Are any of you trying to make a big decision? Are any of you dealing with bad news? Are any of you celebrating good news? Are any of you struggling with skepticism or cynicism or doubt? Pray, 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 James says. In other words, for James, prayer is the answer to everything. It's the response to any circumstance. It's the first response, not the last resort. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the letter of James each week in worship, and we have seen him speak in robust terms about how true faith must express itself through how we live. He focuses on action and practicality, laying out in undeniable and concrete terms what it means to live a faithful life. At the start of his letter, he articulates this high and beautiful theology. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. From there, he directs us to be doers of the word, of this word, goodness. Doers of God's goodness. And then he goes on to teach about how we do that, how to treat each other, not with judgment or favoritism or discrimination, but with consistent, persistent love. How to be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to get angry. How to understand our words as actions and to be very careful with them. James does a lot in his little book. And today, as he comes to the end of his short letter, we read his most practical word. After he writes about the importance of true and trustworthy speech, he moves to strip language back to its most fundamental, the words we speak not to one another, but to God. Prayer is primal speech. In our most broken, panicky moments, our gut level response is this, to call out for God, to ask for help from God. Even those of us who have come to a point where we feel we have given up on prayer or given up on God because of too many disappointments in the past, in our most shattered and despairing moments, our instinctive, reflexive response is still this, to call out for God, to ask for what we need from God. It is so basic and so primal and so simple and so core to cry out in moments of great need, to cry out without wondering why we're doing so, without wondering how prayer works. It's instinct. We call out, we need. But how does prayer work? James says the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective, but what does that mean? What does it do and how? There seems to be a tension between the Christian teaching that in God there is no variation or shadow of turning and the understanding that God can be moved by the prayers of the faithful and by the constant intercession of the Spirit on our behalf. There seems to be a tension between the teaching that God is all good and all powerful and that we have to petition God to use that good power to help us. If all of this is true, that God is good and knows what we need and that God is unchanging, and that God can be moved by our prayers to respond, if all of this is true, then what does it mean to say that 
prayer is powerful and effective and that it heals us. Some have suggested that prayer is less like begging and bargaining and petitioning and more like an audience calling for an encore after a music performance. Recognizing the goodness of what God has already done, we respond by asking God to do again what God has already been doing. The audience crying out for an encore isn't doing this because the band is unwilling to play more. The audience knows the band is hoping for their outcry and the band has planned for it. And the audience knows that the band has saved the best for last and is simply waiting to be asked. So like an audience calling out for an encore, we encounter the good gifts of God in our lives and we are moved to ask for more of that goodness. And God is so pleased that we would ask and is moved to respond. With this understanding, prayer is then both a gift to God and a gift from God. It's a beautiful concept, lovely. But is that how prayer works? Does God hold some goodness back until we in awe and gratitude ask for more? I don't know. I have no idea. What about the heartbreaking fact that so many times we ask for some help we desperately need or someone else desperately needs and the answer we get is apparently no. How do we make sense of that? If the prayer of a righteous person is effective and powerful, then what is the effect? And what is the power of a prayer that doesn't get answered in the way we had hoped? There is no neat explanation for any of this. There is no easy, rational answer for how primal speech works. Any analogy breaks down because there is nothing else like prayer, which involves not what we can see or do ourselves, but what we communicate to God. Prayer involves not what we can control, but precisely what we cannot control. And any sense we make of it is guaranteed to reduce it to something less than what it is. As with other matters of faith, prayer is bigger than what we can understand and it goes beyond what is rational or reasonable or provable. There is no good explanation and there is no proof of what prayer does or how. But there is this longing in each of us, a kind of loneliness, a kind of hunger, a kind of need for a healing we struggle to name. We are yearning for something, yearning for something we don't always have a name for. Some people call what they're looking for peace. Some call it wholeness or fulfillment or satisfaction. Some call it groundedness. You could call it intimacy or a kind of deep soul filling satisfaction. It's a thirst, a thirst to connect with what is real and what is true and what is life giving and what is life. It's a thirst to connect with God and to be a part of God. Saint Augustine said it like this, our hearts are restless, O God, till they find their rest in you. 
This is where prayer begins in this deep, often hidden desire, this thirst for something more. And this is also where prayer ends, in the deep mystery of God, the force behind all that is and ever will be, the love beyond what we can understand or explain, the certainty that cannot be reduced to our little certainties, the living, life-giving heartbeat of the universe. God. All the other work we do because of our faith, serving, listening, caring, welcoming, feeding, pursuing justice, sharing good news, speaking wisely, telling the truth, all of those things make such good sense. It's easy to understand why those parts of living our faith are powerful. It's easy to see how they are effective. It's easy to understand how they are healing. But prayer, prayer, prayer is mystery lifted into mystery. We lift our hearts and all that is in them into the greatness of God's love and concern without any control over the outcome. And when we undertake the mysterious and beautiful act of prayer, we aren't doing it alone. We aren't ever doing it alone, but in solidarity with the faithful in all times and places. James writes not to the individual, but to the community. And he means for us to pray for each other and with each other. And even when we're alone, we pray in solidarity with each other and with others. We find ourselves through no effort of our own, through no maneuvering of our own, we find ourselves in the ceaseless flow of God's being within us, within all of us. It is as if we become part of a beautiful unbroken web, connected to each other and to God in ways we cannot see moving in ways beyond what we can comprehend, joined by the invisible threads of God's love. Prayer strengthens that web. It magnifies our awareness of God's presence within us, among us, around us. It increases our connection to the heart of God and to the heart of God beating in each other. We find ourselves joined to God and joined to each other and joined to all living beings. We find ourselves as a part of God's wholeness. We find ourselves drawn more completely into the life of God. And if we are faithful, responding more completely to the will of God, we find ourselves with the power and effectiveness of God among us, we find ourselves healed by the love of God. We find ourselves. We find ourselves. In these last few years of my medical adventures, and especially in these last few weeks of my particularly difficult and painful challenges. I have been so touched and honored to have been told by so many that they're praying for me or that they are sending me good vibes or holding me in their thoughts or in their heart because I know that the mystery of prayer is so great that even the word itself can be daunting. The concept itself can be too much. Sometimes to make the claim to pray feels like too much. To be sent good vibes, to be held in someone's thoughts is to be 
held in the best intentions of another person. That is beautiful and that is prayer too. When a person feels like they don't have faith, how on earth can they claim to pray? But they can, you can. God wants to know what matters to us. God wants to know what hurts us and what we hope for. God wants our healing. God wants to know our hearts. God wants to know your heart. Last week, I shared online some of the details of my current suffering, the extraordinary pain of going through a particular medical treatment five days in a row. And not long after I shared, I began to receive a very specific, very beautiful kind of response. A member of this congregation was the first one to put it this way. He wrote, there are many who would gladly share the pain so you would have less, including me. And then not long after that, a friend of mine from high school wrote, I wish I could take just a little of that pain away and put it on me and everyone else here on this post. And those kinds of responses continued from people in this congregation, from members of my home church, from friends I text with nearly every day, from friends I haven't seen in 30 years, people saying, I wish I could take a part of it. I would take a part of it. We would all take a part of it. It was a staggering experience. What was being articulated was a prayer. Even though the many people saying it were coming from many different backgrounds, including many different faith backgrounds. What was truly staggering was what happened the next day when I had to go back for my next painful, difficult medical treatment all these people praying for me. I knew it, it mattered, it meant so much, all these prayers. But the pain didn't go away. The pain did not go away. It hurt just as much that day as it had the day before. It was really, really hard and awful. And my prayers did not change that fact. And the prayers of everyone else praying for me did not change it either. But what did change was this. Even in the midst of my pain and suffering, I suddenly, without any effort or decision on my part, began to see, to visualize, to imagine a whole crowd of people gathered around me in the treatment room, gathered around me, gathered around my pain. People who had said they wished they could take a little portion of it. People who had said they were praying for me people who had said they were sending good vibes to. They were gathered around me, gathered around my pain, even touching my pain with hands that cared and loved. And the group gathered around my pain included so many of you. And at the same time, I felt so strongly, so strongly, the presence of Jesus right there with me in the room as I hurt and as I cried. The pain still hurt, but the prayer, the 
prayer was powerful and effective and healing. I felt the healing. And it was so clear to me that I was held, that I am held in a web of love beyond my own making. And so are you. It was so clear that I am connected to all that is love. And so are you. It was so clear that I am carried in the very heart of God and that this is not my own doing. It is prayer, the prayers of others that carries me to God's heart when I can't find my way there on my own. And it is prayer that will carry you there too. We are so grateful to all of you for your support of the life and work of this congregation. You're already giving support by being part of this worshiping community today. Thank you again for joining us. Many uh, who are members of this local congregation are also involved in hands-on work or distanced work in the ongoing ministries of this congregation that we've been able to continue during the pandemic. Certainly another way of giving continued support uh, is the offering of our financial resources if we are able to do so. We certainly welcome uh, contributions uh, along those lines, whether from our congregation or from those uh, who may be participating from elsewhere, but who are finding uh, these offerings of our church uh, on Sundays to be beneficial, important, meaningful to you. You will find on the screen now uh, one way of making your offering financially to the life and ministry of this church, and we are grateful if you feel inclined and able to do so. When we worship together in person, our offerings are uh, experienced by us as an act and part of our worship itself. And we hope that if you are making contribution financially to the life and ministry of this congregation, that it feels very much to you like an extension of your worship. Thank you very much.
May the peace of the Lord be with you. May the peace of Christ 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 and the love of God be with you always. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you. May God be gracious to you. May God give you grace to love with all your heart. That you may do justice. To love with all your soul. That you may show kindness. To love with all your mind. That you may walk humbly with your God. Friends, go from this hour to love the Lord your God with all your might. And love your neighbor as yourself. Go in peace to follow Christ. Amen. Amen.